I think Nadim, uh, I have some problem in the desktop because even in the last lecture by Professor Neelam, I was not able to connect it in the desktop. So all set, we have one minute to go. We are live on YouTube, sir. So should we start? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah, I'm ready too. Right. So should we start. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 14C. We are with Hematology, General and Fundamental. And we have two extraordinary hematologists here, to one to moderate and the other one to present. And the topic of the day is morphology, the central pillar of hematology, decoding the peripheral blood film, which is so very important. I take pleasure in introducing the moderator and Dr. and moderator sir will introduce the presenter. The moderator is none other than Dr. Kanal Deepak Mishra, who is an MBBS MD from AFMC Pune. He is a postdoctoral fellowship in hematology from Ames, New Delhi. Senior consultant in laboratory hematology and molecular pathology. And director, Department of Laboratory Science, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. He is an MBBS honors with gold medalist. Ed educated the best medical graduate in 1983 from his college. He did MD pathology from AFMC Pune. His major interest is flow cytometry, molecular genetics and hematology, including MRD in acute and chronic leukemia, including MDS, MPNs and multiple myeloma. He has also developed interest in solid mole molecular pathology, including liquid biopsies, trained in hematology at multiple international centers. And he's also the examiner for MBBS, MD, DM, DNB in hematology, clinical pathology, hematology, and transfusion medicine in various centers. He is a visiting professor at IIT Kharagpur, NIT Raoul for its MS PhD program in biomedical science. Has published more than 90 international and international and national journals. He is a fellow of the Indian College of Pathologists and Indian Society of Hematology, member of the National Academy of Medical Science, chair of the ICMR Task Force Subcommittee on MDS and national convener of the Indian MDS Registry Initiative, current president of Molecular Pathology Association of India and former president of IAPM, ISHBT, former secretary of IAPM and former editor of the Indian Journal of Hematology and Blood Transfusion, currently a board member in the Board of Directors of International Society of Laboratory Hematology and the Chair of the American Society of Clinical Pathology for Certification Program for India, member of the EHA. Sir, I would uh, request you to introduce the speaker and then we'll start from there. Sir, you please take over. Dr. Mishra, please. Very, very good evening to everybody and at the outset I must thank uh, Dr. Nadeep to have uh, put this in place. Uh, the way he was introducing me looked like it, he will take over the entire presentation. Uh, my apology. Today is a very important talk uh, in the fundamental series of hematology. And as you know that uh, morphology is the central pillar to any diagnosis. And uh, peripheral blood smear examination in hematology is one of the most important basic fundamental parameters for any hematological diagnosis and even into non-hematological uh, problems. So today we have a distinguished uh, speaker with us who is none other than uh, Professor Devdat uh, Basu, who is the professor and head of pathology at the prestigious Jipmer uh, Puducherry. Uh, I have been to his department as a fantastic department and uh, 
currently he is presiding over it and uh, as he is a hematopathologist i am sure the hematopathology has got a preeminence in that center i think uh, that department had the dm program and due to some reason probably uh, the dm program has uh, gone a little behind because of uh, uh, teacher service issues uh, dr devdatta is uh, uh, very well published more than 200 publications he did his senior residency uh, from the uh, prestigious maulana azad medical college and since then he is a faculty in pondicherry i have been to his department number of times for md pathology exams and i have seen him working very diligent astute morphologist and he has a great interest in morphology in hematopathology he has a great interest in automation in lymphomas and into various other hematological uh, disorders so with that uh, brief introduction i will not come in between devdatta and uh, you i uh, would request uh, professor basu to start his uh, talk okay thank you dr deepak and uh, uh, very good evening to all of you and uh, uh, a special thanks to dr nadeem for uh, inviting me and getting me on board in this pursuit so without further ado i will start the uh, presentation give me a minute yes so we can see your screen all right so let's pursue the peripheral blood this evening any building or any monument needs pillars okay whether it is the uh, ancient uh, parthenon at the greece or the thousand pillar corridor at rameshwaram temple or whether it be a modern uh, absolutely a modern architecture or for the uh, people in kolkata the uh, food court of the south city mall all buildings all edifices all institutions need pillars and if the pillars have inscriptions this is a pillar in the ancient greece in the in the pyramids where the inscription or the pictograph of hieroglyphics was decoded by jean frasier champollion so that makes uh, the the event even uh, better so this evening Uh, thanks to dr nadeem he coined the title for this talk this session as morphology the central pillar decoding the peripheral blood film so in the next possibly an hour we will uh, find out clues in the peripheral blood films that help us in diagnosis uh, you know the basics of hematology is a smear the counter and the microscope and uh, let us see how the peripheral blood and uh, looking at a peripheral smear uh, helps us in solving problems i always put this slide up whenever i i talk of anything in hematology i mean this is something that happened in 1845 200 years ago probably electricity was also not so developed so can you imagine someone sitting on a microscope and looking at a drop of blood and arriving at a diagnosis john hughes bennett did this morphologic diagnosis of leukemia in that seminal uh, case report of his where he called the patient had splenomegaly possibly due to suppuration of blood this this panel here shows a drop of blood unstained under the microscope and after adding uh, adding acetic acid uh, you know acetic acid is a component of your turks fluid uh, where you do the wbc used to do wbc counts uh, the rbcs get uh, dissolved and all that is left is a is are the sheets of myeloid cells neutrophils 200 years ago this was the first kind of morphologic diagnosis of leukemia and the disease was diagnosed by just a drop of blood under the microscope so what might a blood film help us to do decoding the morphology may help us in diagnose a disease prognosticate a disease we'll come to all of these in a bit monitor a disease give information on complications and side effects detect pre analytical or analytical errors in the output of an automated instrument over the past few years as you know automation or the cell counters have taken over hematology and the need for doing a peripheral smear has really come down but peripheral smear acts as a complement to a automated cell counter it confirms or explains the flags that are given by the instrument and at times tells us something that no automated instrument can yet tell us it in other words opens the window to the world of clinical diagnosis 
So what are the indications of looking at a peripheral smear? I mean, as I said before, with automation, once you get the counts, probably the indications of peripheral smear over the years has decreased. But still, when a physician initiates a request based on the clinical uh, indications, uh, clinical features, or abnormalities in a past blood count. So that, that's one of the indications where we need to do a peripheral blood. When the indication is based on the laboratory requests, either as an abnormality in the count that is detected on the cell counter, or the flags that are given by the cell counter, or as a policy, like some institutes have a policy of uh, making smears for all the cases that come, or you, you base it on certain guidelines, uh, it, that depends on lab to lab. So the, the requests are initiated both at the clinical level as well as at the laboratory level or as a part of curiosity. So whatever it be, there are certain consensus criteria. And if you look at this article that individual follow, uh, labs follow their own criteria depending on the patient population, the type of analyzer used, etc. But generally, if your mean corpuscular volume is less than 70 or more than 105, RDW more than 22, platelets low, platelets increased, a first sample in a neonate, no WBC differential or incomplete differential count uh, available on the uh, counter. All these are some of the consensus. How each laboratory, each department follows their own different criteria for uh, looking at a smear. However, this is something that I always tell my postgraduates or trainees, that if you have to master the art of peripheral smear examination, look at each and every case possible whether normal or abnormal in the beginning of your career the first month or the first two months maybe the first six months look at all the smears that come so that by the end of that period you are so familiar with the normal that you would be able to pick up what is abnormal in a jiffy so that should be your aim look at smears till you know that what i am looking at is abnormal this finding is not what is normal that is where you will start your learning and as always, correlation with the clinical history, histograms, automated parameters always resolves most of the issues. And these are four articles. Those, those uh, who are into training, I have always shared these four important landmark articles which help you in looking at a smear and getting guided by uh, these, these articles. So let's start at the very beginning. I mean, I, I hope you all recognize this snapshot of from the film Sound of Music, where before you had to sing, you had to learn your do, re, mi, or before you knew your alphabets, it was A, B, C. So let's start at the very beginning. And the very beginning of looking at a smear comes looking at the gross slide itself. A good look at the slide with a naked eye will tell you a lot of things about the case. The quality of preparation and staining, these are all four well-made, prototypic blood smears, as we say, but it tells you, gives you a lot of diagnosis. If you can look at it, the one on the absolute left, one in the second, third, and the fourth, each of them tell a story. The one that is on the extreme left is obviously a polycythemic smear. The next one is a normal smear. The third one is an anemic smear. And the fourth one is there is some kind of protein in the blood, and that is what is causing the gamopathy and the bluish discoloration. Many a times, samples sent by the clinician from the central line, which is heparinized, also has this blue color. Okay, so this looking at a gross appearance of the slide is good enough. You all must be aware by now as to what we look at call the optimal assessment area or the zone of morphology. It is something, something over here, not at the head end of the smear, neither at the extreme feathered tail edge, but it is always somewhere in between. And how do we know that somewhere in between is correct? If you look at it, this is the head end, this is the very tail end, and this is where we have to look. So what do we look for? We look for RBCs that are kind of separated from each other, not something that is flat, not something that is crushed, not something that is close to each other, looking like a ruler formation. So look for an area where RBCs are just sticking to each other. There the morphology is the best. So you do all your uh, looking at the differential counts, everything only in this, this area of the smear. That's why we insist that a smear has to be made well. I will not go into the details of how to make a smear and all that because that would not be a part of this uh, talk. So what are the features of a well-stained smear? Macroscopically, the color should be pink to purple. Now, you must know your colors. I hope all of you are aware of what is pink and purple and blue and violet. Uh, that's how we look at a slide. 
microscopically the rbc's should be the red cells should be pale orange to salmon pink what is the color of an rbc anyone knows what is this color of this rbc what is this color neither brown nor orange nor pink the color is called puff and that's the color of the rbc how it should be a wbc the nucleus should be purple to blue that's of a neutrophil mainly the cytoplasm pink to tan the granules are lilac to violet eosinophils are important they have this orange colored granules and the basophils have dark blue to blackish granules which often obscures the nucleus now this is all basic i'm sure all of you are familiar with this now this is a normal smear how it looks it's also very important that the ph of the stain that you use is well maintained and if you get a too basic a smear you will get your eosinophils gray granules and the red cells are gray in color so again this is not a well stained smear there, there there is a problem and you might land into problems looking at a smear like that so train yourself and train your technicians to make good quality smears that's the first trick of the trade now let's look at one particular case on a routine check up the cbc came as this hemoglobin 2.4 TLC 500 platelet count 1200 all right so there is obviously marked cytopenia that the cell counter has given you so now what do you do the first thing you take is look at this smear what are what are we seeing over here in this smear what we are seeing is nothing but fibrin strands and platelets that have been caught up in it so this particular sample had a little bit of a clot which was missed while the cell counting was going on the blood went and the cells were not there so the cell counter gave it as a severe pancytopenic because the entire cell population was caught up in the clot one problem that this clotted samples could do is it could clog your tubes of the cell counter so that was a problem but at very low magnification itself at 10x this is what we do we look at the distribution of cells you select out your a uh, zone of morphology look up 10 good low power fields you can pick up ruler formation you can pick up agglutinated rbcs you can pick up clumps of platelets and you can pick up even big parasites like microfilaria all at looking at just the 10x magnification the lowest power that is for hematology and if you see fibrin strands in your smear like this you reject the peripheral smear reject the sample inform your clinician look boss there are clots in the sample we can't do much about it please repeat a better prepared or better taken sample ensure that you add a proper amount of anticoagulant and mix the sample well while you are sending it so after 10x we have the 40x and the 100x in 40x we look at the rbc morphology in a while we also look at the differential count the differential count of the wbcs is done at 40x at 100x we further reinforce the rbc morphology the wbc morphology look at platelets properly the inclusions and the parasites are all picked up in oil immersion but always start with your low power move on to high power and oil immersion only for these few things you just confirm your findings on oil so the overview of my talk for convenience sake you know would be first we will look at the interpretation of the rbcs then the wbcs then platelets we look for parasites and all the while we learn to appreciate artifact one artifact you've already picked up is clotted samples and we will therefore look at the rbcs with their muscle power the wbcs who are ready to defend and the platelets who build up the vasculature well all right so let's start with the rbcs when we look at rbcs the smears give you a fairly accurate assessment of the red cell size shape distribution and inclusions it also correlates well with your uh, the cell count of the various red cell indices and also another important thing for all of us to learn is we need to standardize the terminologies that we use it's better to call electrocyte rather than pencil shape cells better to call spur cells uh, better to call acanthocytes better to call bur cells let us have some standard uh, definitions or standard uh, ideology about what cell is what okay so better uh, be uniform and it's better to give the scientific names uh, whenever you are encountering them caution must be exercised in deciding whether a morphologic abnormality is actual or artificial we'll we'll go into that in a while again these two uh, are articles which give a lot of recommendations for the standardization of nomenclature and grading 
as well as how to look at and how to grade abnormalities you know it's good to know what do we mean by 1 plus what do we mean by 2 plus what do we mean by 3 plus or mild moderate severe changes so these two articles please all of you those who are actually into the uh, practice of reporting on peripheral smears please get them keep them by your table and look at them you have lovely tables which give you all the basic all possibilities that can be there of the rbcs and what do we mean by normal what do we mean by slight what do we mean by moderate what do we mean by marked in terms of each of them okay like for instance you see birth cells more than 30% report if they are present like that it is given so that that gives you a good idea of how to go about it similarly each of them when do we grade and how do we grade is given very well all right so let's start basic again something that you should all know we compare the size of this rbcs with that of the nucleus of a small lymphocyte smaller than that it's microcytic bigger than that is macrocytic right this is hypochromia when the central pallor is more than one third this is this is all right this is quite all right but these cells are the central pallor being more than one third of the entire uh, circumference so these are hypochromic so you can make out microcytosis and macrocytosis and hypochromia by looking at just a few rbcs compared to a nucleus of a lymphocyte so what does this slide show the nucleus of the lymphocyte is there obviously this is a picture of a microcytic hypochromic apart from the size apart from the hypochromia you also find that the density of the rbcs is very very low okay compared so this is a case of anemia so we we have these again these uh, uh, severity grading is there normal mcv is 80 to 99 femtoliters less than uh, mild would be 70 to 79 so the peripheral smear grading correlates quite well with the red cell indices that you get in your cell counter this one is hypochromic and similarly how do we right or how do we say what do we mean by 1 plus 2 plus or 3 plus okay so this is again technical and this this understand this concept well so causes of microcytic hypochromic as you know is iron deficiency anemia thalassemias both alpha and beta certain hemoglobinopathies especially the ones of concern towards us uh, in our country is hemoglobin e which you know is present in the northeast part of india and hemoglobin d which is uh, uh, figures in the punjab area other causes of microcytic hypochromic could be lead poisoning and anemia of chronic disease in both lead poisoning and anemia of chronic disease it is kind of dimorphic you have normocytic normochromic and also microcytic hypochromic red cells so let's take up one of few of these cases of how do we solve them we have these two cases both microcytic hypochromic the case one is hemoglobin 9.5 the second case is hemoglobin 9.8 okay in solving the puzzle of microcytic hypochromic red cells it's always good to look at the cell counter okay the cell counter values the cbc the red cell indices and it majority of the times all your uh, problems are kind of solved so when they are small and pale there are these two uh, ladies uh, one with menorrhagia the other with as a primary gravida hemoglobin as i said 9.5 and 9.8 the indices of the first lady is 71 25 and 30 all right microcytic hypochromic by our standards the second lady has a uh, indices which are markedly microcytic hypochromic but the mchc is as well as normal okay so there's microcytosis low very low mcv but a uh, hemoglobin is kind of similar so that's the first point of difference we note between these two uh, patients the red cell distribution width in one is elevated in the other is normal normal is around 13 13.5 uh, it's a normal rdw so the next point that we look at is the red cell count the red cell count in the first one is low whereas in the second one it's more than 5 million so there are three major differences that we are finding in the mcv a sudden drop in the mcv in the second case the rdw is normal and the rbc count is high so where are we i'm sure most of you are getting it first case is in the case of an iron deficiency anemia and the second case is a case of a thalassemia trait all right thalassemia traits have high rbc count a very low mcv and a near normal red cell distribution width so once you have got this cell counter values and the peripheral smear examination you go ahead and order a ferritin in the first one 
to look for uh, if facilities are available you can get your serum ferritin and find it low in the second case you would obviously do an hplc and look for hba a2 uh, levels and then go ahead okay so that's how a peripheral smear gives you clues to the diagnosis in the second case if you notice other than the microcytic hypochromic there are few poikilocytes and stippled rbcs you also get a few target cells so that is how you differentiate a smear of an iron deficiency anemia from that of a thalassemia trait it could be beta or alpha mind you both this particular case obviously there is much more to just simple microcytosis and hypochromia there's a lot of poikilocytes okay so if you look at a smear like that there's a nucleated rbc lots and lots of target cells varying shapes and sizes so you know that this is a case of microcytic hypochromic but this would be something that like a thalassemia so this was a case with a 5 year old boy stunted growth pallor splenomegaly and jaundice so this is the typical appearance of a thal and thal intermedia or major thal minor would not be like this thal minor is a differential diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia where changes are subtle but this gross anisopoikilocytosis presence of target cells nucleated rbcs polychromatic cells would indicate that this is possibly a thalassemia major go ahead and investigate there's another case that i uh, i always show and this is again thanks to uh, something that i had learned way back when i was a postgraduate student this was a 22 year old girl she was a nursing student who had this chronic refractory anemia always her hemoglobin was 8.2 9.1 in that range she was refractory to iron therapy and had a very low mcv and look at the slide you find lots and lots of target cells microcytic hypochromic cells and when when you encounter a case like this one of the first investigations that we ask for apart from a detailed clinical history is a simple reticulocyte preparation so retic count supravital stain and this showed these golf ball like inclusions the golf ball like inclusions uh, pertain to a disease called alpha thalassemia and these are the hbh inclusions which precipitate and give you the diagnosis so look at the peripheral smear combined with morphology of the reticulocyte count reticulocyte preparation leads your way to the diagnosis you do your hplc or do your hemoglobin electrophoresis and you will get a fast moving band in electrophoresis uh, and you can diagnose alpha thalassemia this was a case of a 15 year old girl severe pallor now this was a case where the clinician fought with our residents two days ago we had given a hemoglobin of 7 today's hemoglobin is 10 two days ago the mcv was about 70 today's mcv is 79 so they said man you are giving us wrong reports or discrepant reports the resident saw this smear and came up with a diagnosis and told the clinician look between the last smear and today's smear you must have transfused the patient so there is a background of microcytic hypochromic and there are these flattened looking normal uh, hemoglobinized rbcs these are all this the transfused rbcs and therefore the hemoglobin and the mean corpuscular volume changed this sort of a smear also on a cell counter you would give you a dimorphic curve a double peak in your rbc histogram so looking at a smear you are able to give not just the basic diagnosis but you'll also be able to tell the clinician that you did not give me the history of transfusion i'm 100% sure that this patient was transfused within the last 24 to 48 hours and that's why the picture is like this all right so peripheral smear helps you in a lot of ways what about this what would you call this smear this blatant hypochromia look at this all these cells are are they hypochromic they are not notice carefully that this kind of a hypochromia is punched out it is very sharp from the rest of the border so this is not hypochromia this is what is called water artifact it's an artifact of staining where somehow either the stain has got too much water or many a times what happens is uh, you 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 are having a cup of coffee and you do you and you want to wash your cup and you forget you open the tap and you forget that next to the tap is the entire slides being stained the staining is going on and drops of water from the tap that you have opened to clean your uh, cup and saucer falls onto the slide falls onto the stain and creates this kind of an artifact okay so this is water artifact again not to be misinterpreted as hypochromic rbcs so that's what about the 
small ones. Now, what about the big ones, the macrocytes? As you all know, normal MCV is 80 to 99. Mild, moderate, and severe, that's how we classify it. Anything more than 100 is taken as macrocyte. Now, what are the causes of macrocytosis? So you've got a case with an MCV. Whenever you get a case of macrocytosis on the cell counter giving you 106 femtoliter, first thing and foremost, you must look at the slide. You must look at the slide, which will tell you whether the RBCs are in fact bigger than the lymphocyte, that means they are genuinely macrocyte, or whether the smear has polychromatic cells. Polychromatophils or reticulocytes are the immature RBCs, which are bigger than the normal RBCs. So your MCV can be falsely elevated when there is reticulocytosis. All right. So not really falsely elevated, is elevated when there is reticulocytosis. This is the first difference that we have to look at the smear. Is it truly macrocytic? If it's truly macrocytic, then yes, megaloblastic liver disease, aplastic anemia. If it is full of polychromatophils, you think of hemolytic anemia, post-hematinics, and you do a retic count. Okay, so that's the first thing that we check. Also, when you get a very abnormal and high MCV, MCH, and MCH, you know, unthinkable MCV of uh, 50, 60, 70, MCHC going on in hundreds, the first thought that should come to your mind, whether the red cells are agglutinated. Okay, these big, big clumps are picked up as a high MCV. And so when a grossly abnormal indices come, look for agglutinated red cells. So a true megaloblastic anemia would show you these findings. macro -ovalocytes, right? Oval-shaped macrocytes. MCV is usually more than 110, maybe even more than 120. And hyper-segmented neutrophils. So these three things together form the basis of diagnosing a case of megaloblastic anemia on the peripheral blood. You might also get things like the cabo rings, a Howell Jolly bodies, etc., which we will see in a while. This was a case of 14-year-old boy. MCV was high, refractory anemia, transfusion dependent, hemoglobin 6, retic less than 0.5. Okay, now this was the appearance of the RBCs, more or less normal, excepting for, look at some of the RBCs. They are a little nipple. There was a little projection. There was another one there. Slightly abnormal looking RBCs, overall normocytic, normochromic. Now, because this patient was having a refractory anemia, uh, transfusion dependent, not responding to iron, uh, the levels of B12 folate were also done. That was normal. We went ahead and did a bone marrow, and the bone marrow uh, came out to be what we were suspecting. These are all erythroid cells. You would appreciate them. Many of them are binucleated. Many of them are binucleated with a little nuclear bridge between the two. And we were able to give out a diagnosis of diagnosis genital dyserythropoietic anemia. Okay. This was another case which I want to show because, again, a good look at the peripheral smear helped us in diagnosing this disease. This was, again, a 10-year-old boy, a child, whose hemoglobin was very low. The MCV was 100. Okay, it was refractory. And when we saw the smear... Everything looked hunky-dory, normal, absolutely. Good number of RBCs, slightly bigger, neutrophils there, lymphocytes there, platelets adequate. And we looked. We looked. And we looked again. We looked at the smear. Everything looks normal. We looked at the smear. Everything looks normal. Looked at the smear again. About 10, 12 fields looked normal. But was it really normal? Something that is normal was missing in all these slides. What is that normal thing that was not available, that was not visible to us at all? Normally, we did not see a polychromatophils. Polychromatophil, normal percentage is 0.2 to 2%. So at least, if you look at 10 smears, you must find some polychromatophils. In a child with a hemoglobin of 4, you expect the marrow to be reacting and throwing out a few of these uh, immature RBCs or polychromatophils. Absence of polychromatophils. We did a retic count was uh, miserably low retic. We could hardly count a retic in this particular case. So a marrow was asked for and we saw the marrow was very cellular, full of myeloid cells and caught up in them were these few large blue colored cells. Some of them had deep blue cytoplasm. We have this with this kind of protrusions. We call them dog ear kind of appearance. Look at this huge cell. These are basically... Uh, pro-erythroblasts, early erythroid forms. There was The marrow was full of myeloid cells. 
there were hardly a few of these erythroid precursors and that too proerythroblasts with this prominent abnormal inclusion like nucleoli and we were able to give out a diagnosis of pure red cell aplasia in that child. Okay, so looking at the peripheral smear, look for things, also look for things that are missing. Okay, that, that often gives you a clue to a diagnosis. So macrocytic anemia could be seen with megaloblastic, MDS, congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, aplastic anemia, PRCA and liver failure. And when you have a high MCV, check out whether the high MCV is because of reticulocytosis or agglutination. All right. Okay. Shall we move ahead? Let's observe some more. This is, of course, not my. This is a, a image in the cover page of blood in the year 2013. And looking at the vial or the looking at the EDTA tube itself can give you a diagnosis. If you find these little clumps, the thing, and this was a particular case of hemagglutination disease. Okay, so gross appearance of the even the uh, EDTA tube can give you a diagnosis. So this is what we get when with uh, the RBCs agglutinate in cold hemagglutinin disease. It's the autoimmune hemolytic anemia of the cold type. Mind you, though it's a hemolytic anemia, patients may not always manifest with jaundice. They manifest with Raynaud's phenomenon or these obstruction to the microcirculation because of these agglutinated RBCs. And it often happens in the winter, like in this particular case. A resident of Delhi who presented on the very severe winter day of 1st January with jaundice and bluish discoloration of fingertips. The RBCs are all agglutinated and clumped. Any other finding that you can pick up on this particular smear, which can give you the diagnosis. If you look at the RBCs, now don't look only at the RBCs, look at the WBCs too. Look at that there are so many lymphocytes. Quite a few of these cells are lymphoid looking. Okay, they're not, this is a neutrophil. So these are lymphocytes present. So you have a diagnosis straight staring at you. It's a chronic lymphoproliferative disorder with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So one look at the smear will give you, uh, give you the diagnosis, right? Okay. What is this kind of abnormality that we see? RBCs, this is uh, in a case of a 65-year male with osteolytic lesions in the skull, suspected myeloma. Yes, you're confirming the diagnosis, the clinical suspicion of the clinician. Yes, this looks like myeloma. I'm seeing rule formation. This is what is called rule formation. Stacks of RBCs sitting together, one after the other. And this is what makes making a smear in a case of myeloma very difficult. This is different, mind you, from agglutinated RBCs that we saw previously. RBCs there, there were clumps of RBCs. Here, there are stacks of RBCs. This particular patient was a female patient, elderly, who presented with renal failure. The clinical suspicion was chronic renal disease, but again, you found the RBCs are ruling. RBCs are ruling here and there. And notice the background color. The background color is slightly bluish. That's because there are too many proteins in the uh, blood, and they have taken up the stain of the Romanovsky stain. So a renal failure with rule formation, uh, the antenna is all raised and we look further and further and we find a plasma cell. So this particular patient was a case of myeloma, clinically unsuspected, but presence of plasma cells in the peripheral blood. And we went on and diagnosed a case of myeloma with peripheral blood, plasma cells spill over. Rule of formation can be a non-specific finding. All right. Keep it in mind, though the causes are myeloma, Waldenstrom, hyperfibrinogenemia, hyperglobulinemia of any cause. Therefore, chronic inflammatory conditions can show ruler formation. All of you, I hope you are aware as to why ruler formation occurs in myeloma and why not in normal situation. And that's because of the zeta potential. I'll not go into that. But mind you, slight ruler formation of less than 10% red cells can be seen even in severely anemic patient because the uh, zeta potential gets negated due to the less number of cells that are present uh, in, the, in, the, in the body. All right. So only when you see it more than 10% of red cells causing ruler formation, uh, uh, that is kind of pathological. Let's look at the poikilocytes. Now, each of them have a story to tell, uh, whether it be a sickle or a schistocyte or a target cell or whatever. And let's take up some of them one by one. So we have this 12-year-old boy who presented to the gastroenterologist with the complaints of intermittent jaundice and pain in the right hypochondrium. On examination, there was anemia, jaundice, plenomegaly, the three pillars of hemolytic anemia. So this was obviously a patient who suspected hemolytic anemia and the pain in the right hypochondrium would possibly because of he had already got gallstones. 
Hemoglobin was 9, hematocrit was 27, WBC platelet counts were normal, the MCV was on the lower side of normal, and MCHC was high. Now, this is another little clue to the diagnosis that we are going to get. I'm sure most of you would have already picked up what this case would likely to be showing on the peripheral blood, and it showed spherocytes. It showed spherocytes, spherical looking RBCs all over. Okay. So, when you get spherocytes, again, one little thought is it's usually not an artifact. It is most of the time actual. Now, if you want to confirm, if you look at a smear showing spherocytes, as you know, at the head end of the smear, the RBCs tend to stick together. Normally, normally when you're making a smear, the head end, the RBCs always clump together, stick together. That's why we don't look at them. But this sticking of RBCs in hereditary spherocytosis does not take place even in the body of the smear. The RBCs are all disparate. They're all separate from each other because they're all spherocytes. They cannot, they, they, they don't mold against each other very easily. So this is a true spherocyte that is happening. And so what are the two important causes of spherocytes? Hereditary spherocytosis. Hereditary spherocytosis in there, usually the spherocytes are uniform sized. All of them. Hereditary spherocytosis, often the hemolysis is compensated. So you don't get a very high retic count in hereditary spherocytosis unless the patient is in a crisis. But whenever you see spherocytes, the first thing we do is, apart from the history, do a comb test. Direct, indirect combs in hereditary would be negative. Do an osmotic fragility test that would show a shift to the right. And EMA stands for eosin 5 malamide. On flow cytometry, you can pick up hereditary spherocytosis. Though you may not need it always, it's not available just by the history, the negative Coombs test, family history positive, a shift to right in osmotic fragility would give you the diagnosis of hereditary spherocytosis. On the other hand, you can get spherocytes in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So we have this 45-year-old lady who presented with weakness and high-colored urine with a low hemoglobin and a very, very large number of spherocytes. Also notice in this smear, you can spot that many of these RBCs are actually polychromatophils. Slightly bluish tint to them uh, as a polychromatophil or a reticulocyte. So autoimmune hemolytic anemia is the other cause of serocytosis, where the, generally the, the, the history is different. You don't have a family history. You don't have a recurrent history of jaundice. Uh, the retic is high and often your direct Coombs test solves the problem. Also, another thing that we have noticed in autoimmune hemolytic anemia is this RBCs generally tend to stick to the neutrophils. Okay. That, that's a feature of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You can also get spherocytes in hemolytic disease of newborn. Okay, spherocytes, whether it be RH incompatibility or the ABO incompatibility, in cases of jaundice in newborn, you get so many spherocytes, so many NRBCs, Keep it in mind whether this is a hemolytic disease that is going on. Mind you, in premature infants, you might get spherocytes as a part of the normal uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, also, you might get a couple of nuclear RBCs. In a premature baby, uh, term, ba uh, term baby does not show so many NRBCs or spherocytes. Okay, so that is another thing that you must keep in mind when you're looking at a newborn uh, blood sample. So spherocytes are usually absent in normal adults and you can grade them depending on their percentage. As I said, two important causes are these two, hereditary spherocytosis or autoimmune, but there are other causes. First and foremost, transfused blood sample. Notice that first case we showed where the iron deficiency anemia had been transfused. The RBCs, uh, which are transfused, often look very spherocytic. That's because whenever we transfuse uh, blood to a patient of anemia, we generally give out slightly older blood from the blood bank. You know, And so uh, morphological changes do take place in the red cells and they often look very uh, small and uh, compressed looking. It is a feature of hemolytic disease of newborn. It's seen in mismatched transfusions, post splenectomy. Some hemoglobinopathies may also show spherocytes. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, definitely a cause for spherocytes, can be seen. Severe burns, certain infections like Clostridium perfringens, uh, etc., can also show spherocytes in the peripheral blood. This was again a very interesting case. It was a 61 year old lady. Actually, this lady belonged to, we had one. Uh, professor who, uh, whose daughter was getting married and he was from Kashmir and for his daughter's wedding his entire family of five sisters and few brothers all came to Pondicherry and as usual when they come they come to a, a though they are absolutely normal healthy they came for a routine checkup so this first lady who was the, the elder sister of the of our professor 
we found these sorry we found these what are they elliptocytes elongated rbcs they are not hypochromic they are normal looking and then we were wondering and since the whole family was there we said okay come along let's let's get all of you checked up and all of them had hereditary elliptocytosis and they were all perfectly all right through their life and they they did not even know that they had this entity in them i don't call it a disease elliptocytes uh, may be seen in hereditary elliptocytosis but otherwise it's again a non specific finding you find elliptical cells but they are hypochromic we use the word pencil cells for them in iron deficiency anemia and thalassemias there may be a feature of megaloblastic anemia splenectomies and myelofibrosis okay so but hereditary elliptocytosis generally you might find as many as 25 to 75% of the rbcs are elliptical generally is asymptomatic similarly this is again a case of stomatocytosis stomatocytes is relatively common in the southeast asian group and often is asymptomatic so these are all curiosities that you pick up in the peripheral smear examination okay now this is a more ominous uh, finding and you when you look at this smear there is no doubt that why this girl has jaundice why this patient has jaundice the rbcs are sickle shaped rbcs are boat shaped or sickle shaped and this is a prototypic picture of sickle cell disease now apart from sickle cell what else is this peripheral blood smear giving you information you see a lot of target cells and you see if you look at this rbc carefully or this rbc carefully there are these howell jolly bodies okay so this patient with sickle cell anemia has howell jolly bodies and lots of target cells can something be happening you get howell jolly bodies and target cells the feature of splenectomy so this patient of sickle cell anemia is probably undergoing autosplenectomy or has hyposplenism and these are the findings that tell you that there is something else besides the sickle cell the complication of sickle cell has arisen and the patient is hyposplenic this is another cause of anemia jaundice and bleeding and this is something that i always we all tell our juniors that whenever you are on night duty this is one case that is often a nightmare but you must be able to pick it up uh, on your emergency this is anemia jaundice and bleeding and these are all fragmented rbcs schistocytes so that's a nominous disease in itself and you must be able to it's a medical emergency especially both hemolytic uremic syndrome and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura both are emergencies need to be accurately diagnosed because you have good treatment for them otherwise they can be quite fatal you need to be very careful about what is a schistocyte or a fragmented rbc and if you look at the guidelines even if you find 1% or more it is significant you have to report and you have to percentage give the the value of rbcs that are uh, fragmented the fragmented rbcs can just a minute more on this particular entity because they can have varying shapes you know they can have keratocytes helmet shaped cells they could be microspherocytes they could be triangular schistocytes all these are various forms that you need to identify need to know before you label a case as a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia so this is a finding of ominous significance you grade them even 1 plus that is 1% has to be reported and mind you along with thrombocytopenia presence of nuclear rbcs or polychromatophils when the main morphological feature is a schistocyte it is diagnostic of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia whether it be ttp or hus or dic this is important for all of you to really be able to pick up there are other causes of fragmentation like uh, pregnancy induced hypertension metastasis of mucin secreting adenocarcinomas presence of prostatic valves snake bite uh, hemolysis all of these are features of show fragmentation this is again i'm repeating as necessary that you must be able to identify what a schistocyte is this was a 23 year old girl who had ingested an insecticide and presented to us with severe jaundice now what does this rbc show these rbcs they might look like fragmented to someone who's not very familiar but these look more like a bite has been taken out of the rbc a small bite has been taken out when you eat an apple you bite into it and that's how these cells look like so this is bite cell anemia look at these not just bite a part of the rim of the rbc membrane is visible these are bites and blisters 
and lots of polychromatic cells. So this is in itself an important entity of another called white cell disorders. Okay. Now this was a 20-year male who was case of bullous pemphigoid for three months and he was started on dapsone for 15 days. And this is the serial hemoglobin that we, uh, we uh, saw. Hemoglobin progressively decreased over a month and the retic count progressively increased. And the pedophil smear showed these. Again, the bite and the blister cells. We do a special stain with, uh, called the Heinz body stain and you can do anything crystal violet or uh, methyl violet stain and these precipitates are picked up and you have a case of bite cell anemia. Dapsone induced hemolysis can occur. This is this sort of a bite cell disorder is very common in G6PD deficiency but it can also occur in patients who have uh, dapson with normal G6PD levels if your drugs are more because these these drugs cause like uh, dapson hydroxylamine causes oxidative stress free radical damage to the hemoglobin the disulfide links form between the hemoglobin and cell membrane and they damage the membrane the the uh, the free radical damaged hemoglobin sits on the uh, cell membrane and that part the damaged hemoglobin does not get stained and therefore it looks like an empty space. It's basically the precipitated hemoglobin that gives this formation of bite. Earlier we used to think it is the pitting and culling of these cells in the spleen, but no, it's basically the damaged hemoglobin sitting on the membrane, uh, surface cell, surface membrane, and this part becomes unstained. These uh, bodies, Heinz bodies they are called, are stained by methyl violet or brilliant crystal blue. And again, if you see more than 4%, please report as a bite cell anemia. So this was a case of young woman with jaundice and liver failure. And again, similar, instead of a bite, we saw these little protrusions here and there. Lot of polychromatic cells, lot of spherocytes. And this was a case of Wilson's disease. So basically, bite or blister cells are irregularly contracted cells. G6PD deficiency, oxidant drugs, chemicals, chronic liver disease, Wilson's disease, and morphologically as a part of postplanectomy. But here, this is the area where... Uh, this often comes up, lands up as emergencies, lands up with acute onset jaundice, acute onset hemoglobinuria, and the patient can have renal failure and uh, can be uh, quite a morbid condition. One other thing that when you diagnose G6PD deficiency, remember the, the reticulocyte or the polychromatophils that arise due to the hemolysis are rich in G6PD. It is only the adult hemoglobin G6PD levels which are low is the cause. No, normal polychromatophils, even in G6PD deficiency, have good amount of G6PD which can tide off. Therefore, when during the period of acute hemolysis, the reticulocytes have enough G6PD. So, your G6, if you are going to quantitate G6PD, you may uh, land up with a false positive. Understood? Reticulocytes normally have more G6PD levels than a normal RBC. So, when there is reticulocytosis going on, the G6PD levels are well maintained. So during the case of post-acute hemolysis phase, bite cells give you a clue to the diagnosis. Once the hemolysis uh, subsides and the patient becomes normal, at that point of time, when reticulocytes disappear, if you do a G6PD level, that is the point of time when you will be able to accurately diagnose G6PD deficiency. But during the acute phase, it is the bite cells that give you a diagnosis. This was a case of a 10-year-old sick child, Sardar, child with recurrent jaundice and splenomegaly. Again, the classical appearance is target cells. Slight microcytosis, hypochromia, a lot of target cells. So this target cell is a feature of a good number of hemoglobinopathies. So, target cells basically occur when there is increased surface to volume ratio, which signify either excessive surface membrane formation or excessive loss of volume or hemoglobin uh, in content. And again, you can grade it. And there are many causes of target cells. This is a case of thalassemia. Notice the NRBCs and target cells. This is a case of sickle cell, lots of target cells. This is a case of hemoglobin C. There are these crystals of hemoglobin C, extracellular crystals, which give you the diagnosis of uh, hemoglobin C. Uh, hemoglobin C is not very commonly seen in our country. It's more common in the Central African area. And this is a case where target cells, NRBC and Howell Jolly body I'm sure if you see this, you're going to ask your clinician, this patient must have had a splenectomy some days back. And that's, that's the feature of a, uh, of 
for post-splenectomy smear. So target cells can be seen in a wide variety of conditions. Severe iron deficiency anemia, thalassemias, hemoglobinopathies, liver disease, both alcoholic and obstructive, post-splenectomy and premature infants may have targeting. Target cell is also an artifact of blood fill preparation because of slow air drying or over anticoagulation of samples. Keep that in mind. At times, it can uh, mislead you because of its being an artifact. These are acanthocytes or spur cell anemia. Spur cell anemia, acanthocytes, irregular projections from the red cell membrane, uh, not a very uniform distribution, irregular in number and irregular in height. So, acanthocytes are a feature of significant finding of asplenia along with Howell Jolly bodies and targeting. They are, of course, a feature of A-beta lipoproteinemia, macleod phenotype, and alcoholic liver disease. Similarly, when you face birth cells, think of kidney. Renal failure is a finding. Mind you again, such birth cells or crenated RBCs could be an artifact. It's a very common artifact of prolonged storage of blood in EDTA. If you have collected the blood in the morning and making a smear in the evening, likelihood that all your RBCs will get contracted. So keep that in mind. And it's a significant finding in renal failure, uremia, patient on dialysis. But it is also a very common storage artifact. What are these? Acanthocytes or echinocytes or what? Such a bad smear. This is obviously a stored sample that has come to you. The, uh, the person must have collected the sample long ago, forgotten all about it. And when their uh, professor scolds him, he sends a sample quietly uh, to the lab. And this is what you will get. It's a stored sample meant for rejection of the sample. 78-year-old male with massive splenomegaly. You find here these red cells telltale evidence, they look like your teardrops. So that's a teardrop or also known as dacryocyte. You see a shift to the left, you see a nuclear RBC and you have what is called a leucoerythroblastic blood picture. You order a bone marrow and you get fibrosis in the marrow. So presence of fibrosis in the marrow is reflected as the teardropping in the red cells. The, the RBCs find it difficult to squeeze out of these fibrotic sinusoids and therefore apparently their shape becomes tear-shaped. Similar uh, tear dropping and leukotriblastic anemia in a child with massive hepatosplenomegaly, in a baby with a massive hepatosplenomegaly, clinically thought of as storage disorder and we had these uh, teardrop cells, NRBCs in the smear, uh, occasional blast also, a bone marrow aspiration. This was leukotriblastic picture, a lot of NRBCs left shifted. And a bone marrow aspiration was done, which yielded a dry tap. Bone marrow biopsy then significantly gave us the diagnosis. This is what you get in osteopetrosis or marble bone disease. Lots of osteoid being formed, osteoblastic proliferation, and defective cartilaginous uh, bony trabeculae. So this was a case of uh, osteopetrosis. You confirm it with the x-ray that shows this absence of any medullary cavity in the bones and you arrive at a diagnosis, uh, a relatively uncommon condition, but we do get to see it. So teardrop cells are again abnormal, leukotriblastic blood picture showing fibrosis. Certain hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias may also show these poikilocytes. It's also a finding of liver disease. But in accompanying with shift to left and with uh, NRBCs, you usually make a diagnosis of leukotriblastic picture their tear dropping is significant. Now, this was again another example where a bad slide, look at it slide, if you put it under the microscope, you would feel that this is storage sample. What will I gain out of getting this, uh, anything in looking at it? This was, however, a patient with recurrent jaundice and splenomegaly with a high retic count. So that was what made us, even though the smear was bad, we looked at it a bit carefully and on oil immersion, we found the red cells having these stipples basophilic stippling and we came across with a diagnosis of pyrimidine 5-nucleotidase deficiency, cause of hemolytic uh, anemia. So stippled RBCs can be seen in again a wide variety of conditions. They are often very subtle uh, and you need to really uh, change your fine focus to be able to identify them. But once they are, they have a lot of causes. They are basically a feature of lead poisoning, thalassemias, megaloblastic anemias, other hemolytic anemias. And again, this is something that we have seen. Basophilic stippling gets lost when the RBCs are stored for long in EDTA. And therefore, this is one of the reasons. It's an important finding. Uh, gives you a lot of clue to the diagnosis where blood films should be processed fast. What do you see here? 
again an inclusion in the red cells called Howell Jolly bodies. Again, these are basically aggregates of DNA, report if they are present. We look for Howell Jolly bodies in post prenectomy states. It's important when we are following up patients with refractory ITP or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay. In the, both these conditions, splenectomy is done. And when they follow up, you please look for Howell Jolly bodies and say that the splenectomy is uh, there. Because many a times, if it is refractory, the platelet count has not come up. Uh, in a case of post splenectomy, ITP, three months down the road, the platelet counts haven't picked up. You look at the smear and you don't find Howell Jolly bodies, please report it. That I am not getting Howell Jolly bodies, please look. Maybe there was a spenunculus. Maybe your splenectomy was inadequate. Maybe uh, uh, you left behind a kind of an ectopic spleen, which has now taken over the, uh, the platelet phagocytosis that goes on. Okay, so this is again important from a prognostication or monitoring a patient of uh, splenectomy. So what do we learn from the RBCs? The type of anemia, morphologic classification, hemolytic anemia and its types, the various poikilocytes tell stories of their own and red cell inclusions. This was a courtesy one of my resident who found, you know, RBCs and the smears, actually you fall in love with them as and when you see them. So they are also responding and reciprocating every time. All right. So let's now move from the RBCs to the WBCs. Let's now pursue the WBCs. Look at this neutrophil that I found one day. It looks as if someone is running a race, you know, pursuing uh, its own dream. So WBCs add color to the peripheral smear. Again, I'm sure most of you know that, how to convert the cells in the smear to a total leukocyte count. This is how you counter check your count of values, roughly multiply by 2000 per high power field. You count the number of WBCs in a high power field, multiply by 2000 and your total leukocyte count is available. If there are too many of them, more than 20 per high power field, do a multiplication by 2500. So this way, you correspondingly always counter check your uh, cell counter values when you're looking at the smear. Nucleated RBCs often give a spurious increase in automated cell counts because these NRBCs are picked up as uh, WBCs because the cell counter doesn't know uh, which is what a cell. It's only when we look at them, we find it. So many a times in hemolytic anemias, when there are a lot of NRBCs, the total leukocyte count becomes haywire. It comes out in lakhs. It's not because of the WBCs, but because of the NRBCs having been identified as WBCs. So if you find 10 or more NRBCs uh, per 100 WBCs, you need to correct it. It's just simple mathematics and you can get your normal WBC count. Although rare, at times neutrophilic agglutination occurs, either a clotted smear or severe infection, and that can falsely reduce the automated TLC. The principle of automation is that you allow the cells to pass out in a single file. So we had this 20-year-old male with sepsis, and it is as truly seen, a lot of neutrophilic shift to left, toxic change. The counter gives at times, not the, not the newer counters, the monocyte count and the metamyelocyte count can be kind of uh, variable. But mind you, at times, they may mistake for monocytes. Monocyte, in a, if, you, if you look at smears and if you look at counts regularly, you would find that the counter gives lots of monocytes compared to what you see in the smear. You know, normally by tradition, we know that monocyte count is 2 to 6%. But if you look at the counter values of monocytes are about 10, 12 in majority of the cases. And that's correct. The, the cell counter gives the true monocyte count because monocyte tends to, they are large cells. So they accumulate at the tail, tail end of the counting area. Maybe differentiated, difficult to differentiate it from activated lymphocytes. So you may skip them. Okay. So this is important. You believe your differential count that you get on the cell counter because monocytes can often be missed on a manual differential count. How do we say, what is an immature granulocyte? We look at what are called band forms. These band forms are single lobe neutrophils, the most immature of the neutrophils. And it is recommended that band neutrophils be counted as segmented neutrophils in your differential count. In only in neonatal sepsis, do we, can we do a separate band count? Count them separately because more than 15% has a poorer prognosis. Otherwise, you include band cells <coughs> along with your neutrophils. And predominance of band cells indicate that there is a neutrophilic left shift. In the consensus guidelines, these are all that is there. Normally, you should not find a single blast. Metamyelocytes, not more than two. Myelocyte, promyelocyte, not more than one. Atypical lymphocytes, not more than five. 
nucleid RBC is not more than one, plasma cell even one. So this is the consensus, this is the guideline. If you find these as a part of your differential count, think of that it is not a real normal smear. What information does this smear give you? Again, look full of water artifacts, but you have no, the slide has come to you, the form has come to you, the sample has come to you without any history. One information that you can give to the patient is, this is a lady's sample. It's from a girl or a lady because you can pick up the drumstick or the bar bodies. So the power of observation is that you can, you can uh, even identify the gender of the individual without knowing it. This is what is called toxic change, a very important uh, finding on the peripheral blood. Neutrophilia with toxic change indicates that there is an underlying infection, a bacterial infection there. I still remember another case where we kept repeatedly saying that there are toxic changes. The clinician kept saying, oh, there is no focus of infection. We have given a course of antibiotic. It's possibly leukemia. Then finally, there was a pericardial, uh, pyopericardium in that patient which was diagnosed. Okay, so so... Toxic change is an important finding and the spectrum is not just toxic granules, toxic vacuoles, dole body, this blue colored sub uh, uh, membranous uh, structure and apoptosis, uh, degenerated neutrophils. All these combined together form what is called toxic change. Now this was a 35 year old post lady post chemotherapy under GCSF. Again, looks like toxic change, but mind you, this is nothing but a shift neutrophil. When you give the patient uh, colony stimulating factor, the marrow shifts out. If you remember, one of the changes that take place from myelocyte, metamyelocyte uh, to a neutrophil is packaging of the granules. So generally, the immature neutrophils, immature myeloid cells have more granules, at least look more granular. Uh, so that's why you get this kind of a shift to left appearance when the patient is on GCSF as well as during sepsis because the marrow is pushing out immature granules, immature neutrophils whose granules haven't got really packaged very well. This was another case, eight-year-old child with recurrent chest infection and look at the neutrophils here, very prominent brownish, violaceous colored uh, granules and this, looking at it, you would arrive at a diagnosis of chediac Higashi syndrome. So that's what it is. This particular case, an 11-year-old, 11-month-old child with delayed milestones and hepatosplenomegaly. Neutrophils have vacuoles. Lymphocytes have vacuoles. That's another morphological finding. Vacuoles in these leukocytes is an indicator that this child possibly has a lipid storage disorder. There's lipid vacuoles within the cells is indicative that you do a marrow and you find these lots of foamy macrophages, Suran Black positive, and this was cases of lipid storage disorder like Neyman Peck or Woolman's or whatever. This was another slide or a smear that I am very fond of. This is probably the only time so far that my, my photographs have adorned the page of the blood journal. This is basically an incidental finding in a jaundiced newborn bilirubin crystals, indicative of severe neonatal sepsis. Not seen in so much in hemolytic disease of newborn, but bilirubin crystallizing within the neutrophils, either as long crystals or short stubby crystals, is a feature of severe neonatal sepsis. Okay, this was a college student with fever and cervical lymphadenopathy, and you have these atypical downy cells or various appearance of uh, uh, dancing skirt appearance, and these are these atypical reactive lymphocytes. This often could be mistaken for blasts, so you have to be very careful. A good clinical history, uh, the typical history of a short duration of fever and cervical lymphadenopathy in a young person, you would make a diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis or viral uh, reactions. Currently in COVID smear, this is at times we are getting it. Though, though reactive lymphocytes are not so prominent, you get basically neutrophilia, lymphopenia, eosinopenia, the neutrophile lymphocyte ratio of more than three, according to our study, is, is quite indicative of severity of the disease. These reactive lymphocytes have been given a fancy name of covidocytes, and you also get thrombocytopenia. So this is again a feature of viral infection that you uh, get in uh, many conditions. This is again not my own case, but again from blood, why I'm showing it to you is that Lymphocytosis is normally associated with acute viral infections, right? Acute bacterial infection causes neutrophilia, excepting for pertrusis, whooping cough, where there is presence of mature appearing lymphocytes in the peripheral blood. 
okay, the possibly the only bacterial infection which shows lymphocytosis uh, because most of the bacterial infection shows neutrophilia. Look at a smear like this, 35-year-old male with splenomegaly and your diagnosis is made. The counts are high. You have the entire spectrum of myeloid cells, a few eosinophils, a couple of basophils hanging around here and you make a diagnosis of CML looking at this smear itself. CML is important peripheral blood at diagnosis. During follow-up for accelerated phases where you count the blasts, you look at the basophils and also it's an indicator when you do a peripheral smear for remission status. Okay, the counts have to come back to absolute normal in CML before you can label it as hematological remission. Okay, so that, that's one particular case of CML. Let's have a few of the blasts. This is again a very unique feature we found one of our cases. Normally blasts don't cluster. It's possible the smear was badly made, but we found these five blasts having a party on their own in a smear of acute leukemia. And possibly one finding, morphological finding that gives the diagnosis pathognomonic of something are these or rods. So when you see blasts with or rods, you know your case is acute myeloid leukemia. Go ahead, do the immunophenotype, go ahead, do the cytogenetics, but your diagnosis is there at hand that you're dealing with acute myeloid leukemia. So again, another case, or rod. This is again another case that we often uh, encourage our residents to be able to pick up at whatever be the time of the day. A 50-year-old girl with menorrhagia bleeding from gums and epistaxis, three days, pallor 2+, plus, bleeding spots all over, hemoglobin 3, low counts, low platelets. This is the purpuric spots that have occurred and you find these cells, large cells. The nucleus is kind of indented, often cleaved, figure of 8, buttock shape, all of it is seen. Look here and there and you will find some cells with multiple uh, all rods called faggot cells, do a sudan black stain, they're all positive and you have a diagnosis of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Diagnosing acute promyelocytic leukemia is an emergency. It's an urgent thing. It's, it's rapid provisional diagnosis because you have atra, atra which can uh, change the entire spectrum of the disease in this. Few years ago, or decades ago, APML was one of the dreaded leukemias to happen because of its associated DIC and the morbidity. But now it is one of the better leukemias with a good prognosis. Okay. So you once you get a diagnosis, again, I'm showing too many slides because I want you to identify, keep in your mind that these are all the faggots and how they look like. It helps you out in your provisional. Then you can do your cytogenetics for 15, 17 or APML, rara, uh, fish, whatever. So that breaks your way. Again, another case where morphologically you can make out these blasts are lymphoid. You do a pass stain, find block positivity. You give a peripheral smear diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Go ahead and then do the immunophenotype and further uh, workup of the patient. Same finding, lymphoid cells. But again, these blasts, look carefully, have blue cytoplasm with vacuoles. So you can make a diagnosis of Burkitt leukemia or what was earlier known as ALLL3 by looking at the morphology and coming up with a diagnosis. Then subsequently uh, confirm your diagnosis better. Again, kind of a curiosity where all these blasts have a little uh, tail to them, a projection. We use the word, a fanciful word of hand mirror type of leukemia. Again, a type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's a morphological curiosity. Interesting to uh, look at. 60-year-old male with generalized lymphadenopathy. Now, you have so many of these lymphocytes and you can make a diagnosis of chronic lymphoproliferative disorder. All of them look the same. This patient is diagnosed. Again, look at the smart cells. Case of CLL. Two years later, down the road, the same patient. Sorry for the quality of the slide, but it's a pretty old slide. Two years down the road, apart from these uh, lymphocytes, there was some larger cell, prominent nucleolus. And so... This is a patient who is developing what is called a pro-lymphocytic transformation in a case of CLL. Again, your peripheral blood will tell you that. So similarly, same CLL, one mature looking cell and a large cell with prominent single, at times eccentric nucleolus. That is a typical appearance of a pro-lymphocyte. Pro and as you know, CLL less than 10% of pro-lymphocytes are allowed. If they are 11 to 55%, you call it atypical CLL. If they are more than 55%, you call them as pro-lymphocytic leukemia. 
smudge cells or the you know those uh, basket cells as we call them basically it's a smearing artifact but this also has a prognostic significance percentage of smudge cells in the routine blood smear does predict survival it's it's actually 10 year survival rate is about 50% when the smudge cells were less but much higher when there are more smudge cells so smudge cells is an independent good predictor of cell survival can you tell me the clinical presentation of this particular patient look at it carefully lymphocytes are there we have seen this case before there are these spherocytes so this is a case where the rbc morphology and the wbc morphology will give you in concert the diagnosis case of cll with autoimmune hemolytic anemia many of these chronic lymphoproliferative disorders look alike but if you realize there are subtle differences these are splenic lymphoma with bipolar lymphocytes right this is a typical hairy cell leukemia peripheral uh, hairy like projections and this particular case has this deep clefted nucleus of what you get in follicular lymphoma spill so you have an slvl splenic lymphoma with villus lymphocytes hairy cell leukemia and follicular lymphoma with split three different entities three different morphology but very close mimics of each other morphology can also give you clues to the molecular diagnosis look at this cup shaped inclusion like nucleolus they look like a cup and that is associated with the mutated npm1 so morphology goes a long way in giving you a diagnosis elderly male with cytopenia pan cytopenia but you pick up a blast you see a blast here look carefully you will find here is this neutrophil smaller in size with a bilobed nucleus look again and you find similar such cells these are pelger hue anomaly so pelger hue cells is a feature of mds and this is something that you can pick up by morphology other features of myelodysplasia like hypogranularity or hypergranularity all are morphological features that help you in identifying a case of myelodysplastic syndrome abnormal lobation either uh, reduced lobation or hyperlobation ring neutrophils all these are morphological features that help you diagnose myelodysplastic syndromes this is again well marked with this particular cover page of blood where each of the neutrophils had been turned into a alphabet i mean unless you had morphology at hand you would not ever be able to get such beautiful pictures so decoding the peripheral smear with respect to red cells check the counts that's the first thing you do check the differential count and it's good to rely on the automated differential count especially for monocytes but if you are finding shift cells please make adjustments if you find neutro metamyelocytes etc many a times the uh, automation may not be able to pick you up toxic and other reactive changes are picked up on this leukemia lymphoma spillover and dysmyelopoiesis so that's again a monocyte heart shaped and that's a neosinophil heart shape so when you see these two together remember one joke that we had or one something some like a saying two couples who fell in love but alas it was all in vain right so let's move on from the wbcs and have party with the platelets now that's a little cluster one of my resident sent this picture to me some days back prabhu thank you for this he said this is a mama platelet and their uh, their little kids having a party so what are platelets thankfully there is only one range for platelets whatever be your age your gender your race platelets range from 150 to 400 that is 1.5 lakhs to 4 lakhs okay so that's important but platelets are the most cunning of all the three cells in as far as artifacts and the true diagnosis is concerned roughly when you look at a peripheral smear it's a rough estimate you don't give a count exactly but it's a very valuable check on your counter values one platelet per oil is equal to 10000 platelets this is something that you must do count look at the number of platelets count each platelet that you see by 10000 correlate with your cell counter values and that's it your smear should have an even distribution and if you see two or three clumps that's an adequate uh, uh, platelet so you really cannot give a uh, total count of the platelets on looking at the smear you can say that it is adequate so let's look at a few cases where platelets created problems 35 year old female routine ps the platelet count is normal but the resident is looking at the smear low par high par not finding platelets he's saying no 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 the counter value is wrong i cannot find platelets in this particular case the senior comes next to him and shows look boss all the platelets are in your tail so this is a tailing of a smear a poorly prepared smear with lot of tailed artifact 
and platelets being in clumps get caught in the tail. So always, always when you're looking for platelets, look at the edges and the side of a smear at the tail end of the smear in low power to pick up your platelets. This was a five-year-old boy. This again was an interesting story. I got a phone call from my resident on duty at 10 late in the night. I've got a case of a five-year-old boy with uh, acute onset fever, no bleeding, no organomegaly, good platelet count. And I think I have diagnosed trypanosomiasis. Okay, Chagas disease. Look at that. Beautifully, they almost look like what you call the Chagas disease. She said, I've looked up the net and I found them. This, uh, this, is, this is again from her case, a beautiful example. And she sent me the photograph of what she saw on the net as Chagas disease. Okay, they, they, there was a very uncanny resemblance to them. We were all excited when I went down and saw and found that platelets. These were all same the net showed us platelets of varying abnormal shapes and size. So what happens is when you take blood in EDTA, EDTA causes activation of platelets, basically causes scattering of platelets, lot of morphological changes. So platelets can be a very, very bad mimic for many of the diseases. Okay, so that was nothing but no trypanosomiasis. They were all activated platelets that were picked up on the smear. So be careful of platelet artifacts. At times, if your stain is understained, you may miss out on the platelets. They look very gray. You may come up with a diagnosis of gray platelet syndrome, but this is a poorly stained smear, so be careful about that. We had this case of a 14-year-old female with menorrhagia. Menorrhagia, so there was a doubt whether it's a, a platelet functional disorder. We received an EDTS sample, and the platelet count was quite adequate. Okay. The smear showed scattered platelets. The platelets are all scattered. Now, this is the problem that we face. Is it really like Glanzmann's? Platelet is not aggregated, you know, GP1B, uh, 2B, 3A uh, effect. They prevent aggregation of platelets. So when you have an EDTA sample, it's always good to make a direct finger prick smear. So the first thing that we told was, please get us a direct, next step is make a direct smear. If your direct smear is still showing scattering of platelets, investigate for platelet function. But if your direct smear shows nice clumps of platelets, check out with the gynecologist why that girl has menorrhagia. Okay, so whenever you get sample in EDTA and are looking for a platelet functional disorder, tell your clinician, don't send me the sample in EDTA, send me a directly made smear. That, that is a better tool to look at platelet aggregation or not. So always ask for direct smear to look for platelet clumping or not. Large platelets can be seen in Bernard Solier, small platelets in Viscott Aldrich. Platelet morphology is also very, very important. Spuriously low counts can therefore occur when the sample is clotted, as we have seen before. So please check for the sample and prolonged storage of samples can also cause platelet degeneration and low counts. We had this particular case, a 30-year-old lady with menorrhagia. Repeatedly, platelet counts were done from outside, was low, 30,000, 45,000. She had no gynecological issue apart from menorrhagia, but otherwise nothing. She was already investigated for functional platelet disorder. It was normal. She had had two normal vaginal deliveries, extraction of the caries tooth, but there was never any platelet, uh, never any bleeds, never any uh, disorders like that. She was not on any antiplatelet medication. Our lab platelet count has come as 38,000, also low. So when you look at a smear like that and you find these big clumps. So this was a case of something called as EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia. Normally EDTA scatters platelets, as I told you before. But in very few percentage of cases, EDTA induces platelet aggregation. It is because of exposure of cryptic antigens on the glycoprotein 2B3A. And this is often seen in patients with SLE, infectious mononucleosis, sepsis or uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndromes. Okay, so you get this EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia. There are some ways of tackling that. You can add excess EDTA or take a citrated blood and do your counts, do a manual platelet count. And some people have even advocated using canamycin to the blood sample. But basically, when you get this EDTA-induced pseudothrombocytopenia, do a manual counting or use citrate as your anticoagulant for a count. We had this five year, a 10 year old boy with bleeding gums and prolonged bleeding after trauma since early childhood. She was a child of consanguineous marriage. So when you get a history like this, you will think of a platelet 
disorder a congenital platelet disorder or an inherited platelet disorder so what are the possibilities but you do a platelet count it comes remarkably low it's abnormally low so are you thinking of a a megakaryocytosis or at least total absence of platelets in the body but when you look at a smear you find that there are good number of platelets but they're all giant platelets so this child whose counter gave it a 7000 was a falsely low value because these giant platelets go into the rbc channel and get counted as rbcs and the platelets are left behind left low in count so you can get very abnormal platelets in quite a few conditions. This condition is called as Bernard Solier syndrome, where the platelet count is not so low. It is at least somewhere around 80, 90,000. But because they are so big, they don't get counted as platelets by the cell counter. Giant platelets with this Dole body is a feature of another of the inherited disorders called Mayheglin syndrome anomaly. And that's again something that we often get in our, in our institute also. Now, this was a case of a 45-year-old lady, absolutely asymptomatic, admitted for cholecystectomy. Platelet count came as 95,000, repeated was 95,000, surgery was deferred, and the PS was obtained. The PS showed, again, slight stomatocytes and these giant platelets. Again, she was asymptomatic. These platelets were functional, but because of their giant shape, the platelet count came low. And this is a condition called, again, large platelets, she was a native of Bengal, and this as syndrome has been described as incidental megathrombocytopenia. Some of the, the, the inherited, it's a kind of a disorder that is uh, indigenous to uh, Bengalis. They're absolutely functionally normal, so the platelet count is low because they are giant platelets. Of course, giant platelets can be a feature of Bernard Solier, can be a feature of Mayheglin anomaly, and other conditions also. You can get giant platelets in ITP, you can get giant platelets in CML. So falsely lowered counts are seen because the platelets either agglutinate because of EDTA or procedural, there are clots, or they are large per se, Bernard Solier, ITP, the fresh platelets or the immature platelets are generally bigger. Myeloproliferative neoplasms, the megathrombocytopenia syndromes. Now, here is a little caveat that we have. Post-chemotherapy recovery and ITP on steroids, the reactive platelets, when they come out, they are larger in size. And the cell counters may miss counting. So look for something called the immature platelet fraction on the cell counter, and that gives you a clue that they are possibly, number-wise, they are more, but because they are immature, they are larger, and they are not being counted by the cell counter. So that's, that's a little thing that you have to be careful about. This is another interesting case where we learned a lot of lessons. This was a 36-year-old male with generalized lymphadenopathy. There were 90% plus. It was a case of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And we advised bone marrow and immunophenotyping. And this was a typical appearance of the peripheral smear of an ALL pass positive, And we were quite happy with it. When, when the bone marrow was done, next day itself, the counts changed dramatically. The TLC from 78,000 went down to 18,000. And the platelet count, which was initially 65,000, went up. So what went wrong in this overnight in this one day? When we looked at the smear the next day, we found that there were these things. There were, what are these? These are nothing but blast fragments, fragments of the blast. This was a case of acute leukemia, which had undergone spontaneous tumor lysis syndrome. Okay. Spontaneous tumor lysis and all these, they were not platelets really. They're basically the blast cytoplasm and the nucleus that got fragmented and were counted as uh, platelets. And because the blast degenerated, your TLC went down and the platelet count got up. So this was a case of spontaneous tumor lysis. You can get a similar finding on the patients of leukemia, especially Burkitt, etc. with chemotherapy. There was the suspected DIC case. Now again here, we had a falsely elevated platelet count. She was bleeding from all over, but the platelet count was quite coming as adequate. Now, why was that? When you look at the smear, you find the fragmented RBCs that we showed you, the schistocytes. They are all being picked up as platelets. Okay, so this is a cause of pseudothrombocytosis. Same here. Lots of schistocytes and platelets notice in the background there are hardly any platelets. So the overall platelet count is low, but these fragmented RBCs are giving you a falsely elevated platelet count. So again, in this situation, when you find like this, do a manual platelet count and report. 
this is again a very interesting case which I always show. It's a newborn baby with uh, whose sample came and we got on the smear, on the count, we got 18 lakhs platelet. Okay, so this was case number one and this was I think the appearance that we got. Some of them are from the net. No, I think this was ours. Okay, this is what we got in this particular case. And we were wondering why 18 lakhs and this was the morphology. Platelets were not really increased. Subsequently, we noticed that all the samples that came from NICU that particular day, from the neonatal ICU, had thrombocytosis and this kind of a morphology. We went back and checked and it was realized later that the entire set of EDTA tubes that were meant to be transported to the lab were actually placed on their hot air oven. The entire rack was placed by mistake on the hot air oven and this was what caused the thermal injury to the red cells resulting in a falsely elevated platelet count. So platelets cause a lot of problems. So it's very important to look at the smear whenever you get a discrepancy in the platelet count. So false high counts are rarer though, but it could be seen with microcytic red blood cells, fragmented red cells. This is at times we get confused, leukemic fragments and apoptosis, cryoglobulinemia, hyperlipidemia, bacteria, fungi, parasitized red cells, all can be picked up as platelets in inadvertent heating of the sample. So when you have platelets, look at the smear, when platelet counts come low, why do we need to know? We confirm thrombocytopenia, first and foremost, this is genuinely thrombocytopenia and look for the underlying cause of thrombocytopenia. When the platelet counts come high, again confirm and look for the underlying cause for thrombocytosis. Look at the smear anywhere when platelet counts are normal but clinically discordant or clinically warranted. They want you to let us know what whether the platelet counts they're getting on the counter is right. Please look at a smear for a platelet count. Look at platelet morphology and function. Clumping of platelets in a smear is a good indicator that platelets are functioning normally. Quickly, we'll catch the bugs. This is diagnostic. Usually, it's malaria, but you can also pick up a few other ones. This was a case of newborn baby with jaundice and it was sent to us as, as, as a hemolytic disease of the newborn and we found Pivax. Okay, so malaria could be a, a clinical mimic in many situations. Case of suspected dengue, platelet 40,000 and you find again ring forms of falciparum. In this particular case, there are these rings of falciparum as well as gametocytes of Pivax. So this was a case of a mix of shizons of, sorry, shizons of Pivax mixed malarial infection, you find merozoids. So if this was a case suspected clinically as dengue, turned out to be mixed malarial infection. Is there a morphology clue to a parasite? Yes, there is. Presence of hemozoin pigment in the neutrophils and monocytes. You find them, you look for parasites and you're going to find them. This is one where there's a ring form of a falciparum and pigmented uh, monocytes. Babesia, I have not seen one so far on my own. Borrelia, also not seen uh, on our own, but these are all textbook pictures. Can all be seen in the peripheral blood. Yes, microfilaria we have. Off late, we don't get too many cases of microfilaria, but yes, once in a while we do. And when we do that once, we, we really, this is another thing that a morphology of this particular case, I'll just show you on a drop of blood, and this is what we saw. Okay. This is unstained drop of blood under the microscope and you see the microfilaria swimming. Okay. This particular video is also very nostalgic for me because the voice that you're hearing belongs to a faculty member who passed away uh, some time back. Okay, so this was one of our cases where we saw uh, just by observation into a peripheral blood. Sometimes fungal contamination of the stain can cause problems. Be careful about that. And many of these artifacts can be confused with parasites. This is nothing but, again, fungus, cotton thread, may mimic uh, microfilaria, stippled RBCs may mimic uh, vivax, cabo rings may mimic uh, the ring forms of uh, parasites. So basically, decoding peripheral blood. Now, this is a blast, but look at it, how human the face of that blast is. There are two eyes and a mouth. So the cells really talk to us. If you look at a smear, so when you decode a peripheral smear, you're able to give the cause of anemia, reactive versus neoplastic, likely myelodysplastic syndromes, lymphoma, leukes, spillovers, thrombocytopenia, that there are parasites, and please be careful about artifacts. The challenge is there for the pathologist to ensure accuracy at every stage. 
and even in the age of molecular diagnosis the blood smear remains the central pillar both the pillar at uh, kutub minar as well as the sarnath pillar in the diagnosis of hematological disorders so we can still learn a lot from a blood film and stay safe all of you we we have come to the end of the talk and uh, that's my email id in case and lots of love to all of you thank you very much thank you uh, for your exhaustive presentation yeah i know it was exhaustive uh, so now you have given a talk of almost 90 minutes so i think there must be a lot of questions and you have uh, handled it so exhaustively from rbcs to wbcs to platelets and all the artifacts and it was a treat to listen to you and see the beautiful pictures that you have captured during your course of your professional career so with this i uh, open this up for discussion i I'm, i'm sure a lot of questions must be there so i would need uh, nadeem's uh, help in case there are any questions there in the chat box or youtube Uh, yeah there are quite a few questions uh, uh, i'll go one by one uh, we can first take the questions from the google meet uh, yes, people sure. who are here if they want to unmute and ask directly in pm we can restrict uh, to uh, some important questions on morphology and uh, in the next 10 minutes we can wind up if you if it is okay with you you are the host so i think you take it back with we'll go to all the questions let them question uh, there is no uh, no bar to time sir uh, if sir is not very tired we can you know we hardly get to get him so if he is there so might as well have the questions and let everybody be satisfied yes so uh, from the google meet first well i'm not able to speak up even i'm not uh, So I I read out everything okay. if anybody wants to ask a question you can unmute and ask directly uh hello good evening sir good my sir dr deep shikha yes sir. Uh, sir i have a doubt uh, in case of cml how will we do dlc in cml you do a dlc differential count you mean yes sir okay the D- differential count in a cml generally uh, we do it as we normally do excepting that we be careful that we don't limit ourselves to just 100 cells because there will be so many cells there so you could yes. do a 200 or a 300 or even a 500 cell differential and get the percentage out okay sir thank you anybody else would like to ask a question can unmute and ask Uh, I'll read out the questions. Anybody wants to unmute? Yeah. Hello. Yes, Hello. Please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Shobha. Uh, my question is like in newborn a uh, baby, sometimes the NRBC will be like in hundreds. So at that time, how do we do this? Uh, how do we give this corrected total count? But at that time, uh, this uh, corrected uh, WBC count formula will not be uh, uh, kind of uh, appropriate. It, it, it will be there. I mean. Uh, you generally don't get hundreds of uh, nuclear abscesses even in a in a term newborn that that's unusual you don't get too many you get maybe 5 or 10 but if you have hundreds of differential nuclear abscesses you still hold the same formula is correct 100 suppose you get 300 neutrophils your total uh, total count of neutro uh, nuclear abscesses plus your wbcs becomes 400 if you have 300 of 100 you understand 300 nrbcs out of 100 wbcs your total becomes 400 so you do your calculation based on that oh. so you still can do you can still use the same formula even if the count of nuclear rbcs is more than 100 you can just just work the mathematics out if it's not too difficult okay sir okay thank you you have nrbcs plus 100 no so count the number of nrbcs and uh, get it out it's it's, it's Dr. Deepak, Dr. Bakul Dalal from Bangalore has come. Glad to meet you, sir. Uh, dear sir, I am Dr. Paraniraman uh, from your Pondicherry. So, in a newborn with presenting with jaundice and anemia, how to differentiate the spherocytes of autoimmune hemolytic anemia from hereditary spherocytosis? One in newborn, uh, both autoimmune and hereditary spherocytosis are uncommon. In a newborn, though both can present in newborn. 
and very difficult to really differentiate on a peripheral smear between autoimmune and hereditary serocytosis uh, even in an adult if you, you need a good history you need a good uh, good clinical looking at the smears they say that uh, smears of uh, cells of autoimmune immunity are usually heterogeneous whereas the smear cells of hereditary uh, serocytosis are kind of uniform but that, that's not always the uh, always the easy to identify so because we come across abo incompatibility as well as hereditary serocytosis that's the thing i was you have to do course you have to do the blood grouping you have to do course and then you have to give your diagnosis just by isolated peripheral smear looking at it just you know you say that there are lots of serocytes then advise accordingly thank you sir thank you bakul sir are you dr bakul dr devadatta basu excellent excellent presentation it's a it's a gist of what you have photographed over your career excellent photography and that's what i found the most important part of this presentation you see you you can tell them thousand words but showing one picture it's is worth that and your pictures were outstanding and you have very exhaustively covered almost everything in red cells and a lot of things in platelets and and white blood cells i wish you had more time to complete uh, uh, all even more of this and and once again uh, i am very impressed and uh, uh, good luck to you thank you dr dalal thank, thank you dr dalal thank you very much pleasure thank having you on board thank you having me on board i see there is a question on when there is 92% neutrophils and 7% lymphocytes in the dc of a ps how to report okay bidish has given the answer to that exactly correct it's based entirely on the absolute counts not merely on the percentage whenever you have this problem of whether there are too many neutrophils or too less lymphocytes or vice versa look at uh, total count of neutrophil or side uh the what i want to say uh, to the audience uh morphology is a wonderful tool to to the diagnosis but okay some of them are uh, my own batchmates who have uh, just pulling my leg that's all uh please you some amount of technology to the monitor to interpret because sometimes the cell counter data complement and supplement the morphology Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely, Doctor Deepak. The cell counter. I have not gone into that part today, but cell counter is without a shade of doubt absolutely complementary. You need to know your cell counters and these uh, indices very well and interpret them well. That's why now days even in our lab we do peripheral smears and maybe just ten percent of or twenty percent of all the cases that come to us. We you need to rely on your cell counter uh, without a shade of doubt. Dr. Indrani Lal said, "Binucleated erythroid precursor in marrow is suggestive of congenital disorder." Yes, yes, yes. I mean, occasional binucleation and all are feature of dyserythropoiesis that can be seen in a wide variety of condition. CDA is uh, where you see lots of binucleated erythroid precursors. Yeah, Dr. Bidish Patel is doing a lot of my answering. Thank you, Bidish. <laughs> I think Indranil talked about the binucleated erythroid. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, when you talk about the CDA, the CDA type one is extremely difficult to diagnose. Oh yes. CDA type two is easier. Type three is still easier. So type one is the one which will always give you problems because the this yes, erythroid is very subtle, and the binucleated erythroids will be far too many uh, to make the diagnosis. Yes, absolutely. Should I repeat some of the questions from the chat, which I have copied from the YouTube? Then we will give leukoplastic blood pressure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can. It can give leukoplastic blood pressure, but usually it is more towards. Uh, it can. Uh, once you do a splenectomy, obviously whatever cells are there within the spleen come out. Uh, they are mainly the RBCs, the target cells, uh, acanthocytes, uh, Havel's body, bodies, platelets come out. 
not so much the immature myeloid cells. I mean that they don't need to be. They're not there in the peripheral blood, so you don't really get. But neutrophilia is definitely there. So. Yes, something from the uh, YouTube in case yeah, you have that I am not able to see. So, Dr. Nadim. No, I think that Nadim will facilitate that. I have been copying all the YouTube questions and comments and I am pasting it here. So, you can read them oh, all which you are reading here. Okay. So a lot of them are from YouTube. Okay, fine. Then we will go ahead one by one. Changes Hello. occur in monocyte morphology in Plasmodium falciparum. I am not sure. I mean, I have not really probably paid much attention to monocytes. Monocytes themselves... Uh, uh, there's definitely monocytosis that occurs, but further change in monocyte morphology, I'm not sure. They're probably a part of the reactive lymphocyte process. Uh, this part, I am not very sure. If someone else has an opinion on this, uh, please uh, say it out. You see how plate monocytes have uh, attracted a lot of attention yes. in terms of sepsis. Because these days you have counters which have got algorithms which go yes. Yes. to the mean monocyte the monocyte distribution rate, the mean monocyte volume, and the mean neutrophil volume. These new parameters in an algorithm can suggest if they uh, can suggest, Dr. Sure. Deepak, can suggest YouTube. Hello, can I ask one question? Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'm Dr. Anshu Palta. Yes, please. I'm, uh, yes, please tell me. Yeah, I'm just. I just want to ask, like, uh, as uh, because we are uh, concentrating so much on peripheral blood smear, like normally we tell residents to report anisopyclocytosis, but then I think we should emphasize what is the percentage of aniso and pyclo is there to to be significant to be reported in the peripheral blood smear. Generally, residents are very fond of writing anisopyclocytosis. <laughs> so, no. is it like? <laughs> yes, I mean, you need to train them to first, uh, you know, what is mild, moderate, severe, that yeah. has to be trained. So, it is our responsibility to tell them what is significant or not significant. That's important, okay? So, once they have done, done, done that, they should be able to identify that this is kind of a significant anisocytosis or significant poikilocytosis. If you look back on the uh, guidelines that are given, some amount, you know, up to about 10% of changes is acceptable. But exactly. if you're finding, if you're finding yeah, maybe 5 to 10 percent is acceptable in any given. Obviously, all RBCs cannot be, it's a factory producing millions of cells, so all cannot be perfectly normal. So, only when it is significant should we be able to appreciate that difference that, that, that this is abnormal. So, that is we need to train them accordingly. We need to train them accordingly. Yeah. And then another question, like you said, like the trypanosoma with the plated segments, we can, uh, you know, so what. I mean, although we know we see the variety of platelet abnormalities in the peripheral blood sphere, but sometimes the pictures were so con I, the pictures uh, you showed like were so confusing with trypanosome. Yes, yes. so any any way to differentiate it? No, you know, all these uh, trypanosome especially will have a nucleus. You know, there'll be a nucleus and the plate. So uh, and trypanosomiasis anyway in India is is an very rare. This is very very rare. But even yeah. if you there, you have to be. 100% sure of the morphology. So, trypanosomes, if you notice, though they are that curvy linear, they have a central yeah. nucleus. So, so that's why. Thank you. Thank you. A kind of basophilic nucleus is there. Thank you. And it's a lovely presentation, I must say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oshan has also asked the same question. Are all done, uh, Nadim? Yeah, I think there, there is a question by Dr. Avinash Priyadarshri. What is the multi multiplication factor for manual count of platelet? That has already yeah, been As I told. said, you have to look at at least 10 fields, count the number of average field uh, per hyper field, uh, per oil immersion, and that is 10 by 10. Multiply by 10. 10 to 15 is a, that's why it's, it's never an accurate estimation, but you just give an estimation there. 10 to 15 per platelet. And provided your platelets are scattered and well distributed. If you see a big clump of platelet, that you take it as adequate. There you cannot, unfortunately, give an exact count. But it's basically multiplying, looking at platelets in oil and multiplying by 10. 
Dr. Vubhiti Rai uh, wants to have an opinion from you. He says, Sir, there was a patient post-COVID with 90,000 WBC and 2% blast. The WBC came down from 1 lakh. Can it be from 10 lakh? Can it be COVID effect or leukemia? 10 lakhs. WBC yeah. was 10 lakhs. Huh? 10 lakhs, yeah. No, 1 lakh. 1 lakh. 1 lakh to 90,000. Uh, we have not seen such a high WBC count so far in our COVID years, but we have seen up to 35-40,000 cases are there. Do you get so many COVID samples? About a lakh? No, I mean, you, but only 2% blasts and most of it neutrophils, I presume. So we should consider a leukemoid reaction first before signing it out as a leukemia. With just 2% blasts and the rest of the cells being, I presume you have not mentioned that, uh, rest of the cells being mature neutrophils, then it should be uh, uh, considered that way. As a leukemoid reaction first and then maybe followed up. Dr. S Dr. Somnath Padi wants, nowadays any form of neutrophilia, leukocytosis and lymphopenia to, is to be considered from COVID <laughs> perspective unless proven otherwise? Not really, but yes, I suppose so. Suppose so, with an NLR ratio of more than it is. Yeah. Circulating MEGs in peripheral blood smear once in a while, yes. In myeloproliferative disorders, yes, we have seen. Megakaryocyte fragments can be seen in CML and all. Are, are you referring to MEGs in uh, CML uh, or MEGs in COVID? Somnath? Good evening, sir. Uh, Actually, uh, that is common finding, but uh, recently we saw one uh, circulating megakaryocyte in a case of uh, post-induction chemotherapy in a case of AML. And uh, and uh, and uh, there were a good number of large platelet clumps as well, and platelet count post-induction was 5.5 uh, .5 plaques. Post-induction, post regenerating uh, marrows, yes, megakaryocytes can come out. Can come out. Okay. Sir, and... Uh, Circulating, uh, circulating micro megakaryocytes are known in myeloproliferative yes, blood. Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Of hematological malignancies who are given induction and who are also given colony stimulating factors. You can get can it. have circulating uh, megakaryocytes if you flow them and find them better rather than in morphology. I think that's the end of it, uh, or are there more? Yeah, we'll just wait for a minute, sir, because there is a half a minute lag between Google Meet and YouTube. So if anybody wants to, you know, uh, ask further more questions to the answers which they have got received. I think, sir, uh, one, I have another suggestion, sir. Uh, uh, sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Actually, the main problem that most of the times resident they face is uh, that inter-observer variability on uh, peripheral regarding the platelet count, manual platelet counts. Many times they take uh, platelet count in oil immersion, so single oil immersion as 15,000. And uh, some say, and that's why they give a relatively falsely high platelet count when it is actually not that much. So it is better if we take uh, 10 or 15, uh, maybe 10,000 or 12,000 has been taken to be much uh, approximate uh, value of uh, platelet count that matches with uh, counter values. Because this yeah. usually happens, it usually happens sir, when a counter gives a low count and in the case of uh, thrombocytopenic patient, two thrombocytopenia, counter is telling low value and residents on duty while examining the peripheral smear, they count each platelet as 15 and make it slightly l more than the normal platelet count by the counter and that creates a lot of confusion among the clinicians. Yes, absolutely. Uh, whatever said or done, the most of the time, the counter is correct. You know, you can never be with um, uh, lacks of platelet or however it is there. It is uh, not uh, feasible to do an exact manual count. That's why it's uh, 
I generally don't encourage anyone doing it. It's just to compare, just to be sure that yes, uh, the counter is giving uh, 85,000. My count is roughly around 70, 80, 90,000. That's good enough. So generally, we don't encourage people giving an accurate count from the peripheral smear. The counter is taken to be correct. And it's generally, yes, as you're right, when the counts are low, multiply by 10. Multiply by 10,000. So here I would like to say one thing that the concordance of manual platelet count is to the extent of only 70%. The yes, absolutely. Of the time absolutely. you have errors. And there will be discordance between inter-observers. Absolutely. That. Other thing is, you must see the platelet histogram in the counter. Yes. yes. If the platelet histogram is a smooth curve, best fitted in case of some of the equipments, even if the count is lower, say, 1000 20000 don't do any alter if the histogram is smooth without any serrated edges it has come back to the baseline that's that's good enough Just don't alter it even if it is low so if you try to uh, correct some of the opinion will always err on the wrong side yes it will that's always right. go wrong. so uh, looking at the platelet and the interpretation of platelet count is extremely important there is a question by Dr. Gayatri Priya. How will we differentiate spherocytes from microspherocytes? I am not really very fond of this differentiation between spherocytes and microspherocytes. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense. It's, I mean, we look at, if I, what I do is I look at the heterogeneity of spherocytes. If there are small ones, bigger ones, that's more towards an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Basically, 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 it doesn't really matter whether they are micro or macro because or large size because finally you'll have to uh, do Coombs test and then go ahead and do your uh, test otherwise. You see, I generally don't give too much importance to the size of those sites. They're anyway small and thing. But that's my take on it. I've never found it very useful. Yes. So that is actually a morphologist's uh, delight. You normally see play, uh, spherocytes, either small or normal size, or even macro Yes. Uh, if you look at the red cell membrane disorder chapter, you have something called dehydrated spherocytes and you have overhydrated spherocytes. So many times, uh, you, because of the membrane defect in the spectrum and uh, 4.1 and 4.2 proteins, you can have uh, the leaks into the membrane and you can have overhydrated spherocytes, you can have dehydrated spherocytes based on molecular defects. So, if you are working in a research center which looks into, like in uh, PGI Chandigarh where uh, Rina is looking at all the, or in IIH in Mumbai, they are looking at all the. So, uh, you can have uh, even the same uh, uh, spherocytosis, you can have all spherocytes you can have larger spherocyte. So what Dr. Basu had said is correct because too much of importance should not be given to micro spherocytes than uh, normal size spherocytes or micro spherocytes. The presence itself is, is, is indicated precisely. Many times post-infusion you can have spherocytes. So you must ask whether the patient has been recently transfused. Yes. There is another question by Dr. Avinash Priyadarshi. She says, what is dimorphic anemia exactly? Is it macro and micro or is it normal, micro and macro? Uh, both. Both. I look at it that way that there are two distinct population of cells which may have different etiology like micro and macro may be a dual deficiency or a patient of iron deficiency on treatment has got a normal size population. So this this thing is uh, like that. It's again, you need to classify well, what type of dimorphism is, there is only two You can even have a microcytic hypochromic and a normocytic normochromic like you get in anemia of chronic disease or lead poisoning, etc. So this combination of two different morphology is dimorphism. Hello, hello. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, I just want to, like, just as a query, I want to ask, like, many times when we uh, get a request for megaloblastic anemia marrow, and uh, we normally, what I bo uh, book says, uh, like, uh, retic response is maximum by seven day, okay? But I've seen in many cases, the seven day 
till seven day response is only one percent or two percent, but moment if we jump to eight or nine days, it's suddenly ten percent. So many times I tell clinician to wait at least for one to two days more before going for the marrow, especially in a young uh, person. In elderly, we know we we should go marrow even if we have a megaloblastic picture. So should we revise the guidelines that the peak occurs at seven days or it is variable? It's kind of variable actually. Nowadays we have kind of stopped advising marrows for. Uh, Macrocytosis, which is, you know, it looks like megaloblastic on the peripheral smear and history wise. Mm -hmm. uh, and post marrow, post marrow, see, once you have started the patient on B12 and folate, there is no point in doing a marrow. Yes. You know, because uh, as we know, if it's a true deficiency within 24 the hours, the marrow will become normal. So it is pointless yes. doing a marrow on the seventh day or tenth day. Mm -hmm. Yes, if your retic response hasn't picked up well mm -hmm. enough, yes, maybe at that point of time you could do a marrow. But the retic response, generally what we have seen in a pure megaloblastic anemia who hasn't had any over-the-counter hematinix uh, starts on the third day and peaks by 7th to 10th day, definitely. The peaking is at that end of one week. Is what, But for, unfortunately, currently, we hardly get cases of pure megaloblastic anemia who hasn't taken an over-the-counter. Or what happens nowadays is the moment a patient with anemia comes, uh, they are loaded with a whole lot of uh, hematinix. Hematinix. So, yeah. those are the issues. We hardly find pure megaloblastic many, anemia nowadays. Hardly ever. Yeah, so, but I believe in many times clinicians are very, you know, like they want to clear their beds or something. Like they always yeah. feel it is a megaloblastic do marrow. We, and especially in young patients, we like to wait, you know. But, we and we know that we don't encourage marrows in a, you know, classical yeah, case of megaloblastic. Let's not encourage. Uh, and sir, so picture changes within 24 to 48 hours. Yes, and so uh, doing a marrow is pointless once yes, you started sir. the patient on any treatment. So my question was, can the response be delayed till seven days also? I have seen in many cases. Yes, it is, it is possible to be delayed. Depends on also the compliance of the patient. Okay. Depends on whether there is a associated other nutritional deficiency. Suppose the patient yeah. has iron deficiency, the response may be a suboptimal. So there are lots of causes for But yes, you are right. The delay can be there. Delay can be there. Yeah, thank you. So, those last questions are on the YouTube. So, hello, sir. If yeah, there is uh, only uh, two or three platelet clumps and everywhere on the smear and it is lower than normal, then is it thrombocytopenia or normal? My take is if you are seeing two or three good platelet clumps, it is adequate. Because obviously they have got clumped together, so they are not seen in the rest of the field. If you see two or three good platelet clumps, maybe with 10 platelets or 15 platelets clumped together, even one single clump, I would label it as normal. Adequate. Adequate. I will not do a count. I will not give a uh, count that it is 1,50,000 or 2,50,000. No. All right. The count is definitely high, but not as high considering the degree of uh, hemolysis or degree of anemia. As you know, in thalassemia major, there is an element of ineffective erythroposis. So, the count is not very high as compared to the degree of anemia that the patient has. Anger, it is usually normal. Uh, no reason for uh, retic to be high in uh, minor. There is hardly any hemolysis going on. So, I think that will uh, 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 should we stop here? Uh, 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 can I last? Uh, uh, I'll, I, I, uh, I'll try a little bit of Dr. Ansu's uh, question. You know, when you do this retic con following treatment of beetle pellet, many times we think that CAZ is not so common in India. Yes. 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 Yes, sir. My, uh, it's not a uh, thing. I just want to say something since uh, Sarah's presented excellently on the morphology of the smears. 
and uh, the morphology pioneer morphologist and sir since you are there so nowadays uh, is it uh, i think we should practice the uh, the from the morphology point of view what we see in the petrosphere on the narrow what is the likely molecular abnormality to be tested uh, to be very specifically to be included in the report and uh, i will be sir very interested to attend a talk like when morphology like npm1 positive like copin nucleus of the myeloid blast and npm1 was done and it came Thank you. 